So uh, welcome to the sort of notary tough, uh, the update framework um, intro discussion. Uh, my name is David Lawrence. I'm the head of security at Docker. And with me, I have Justin Capos. I'm a professor at NYU and creator of the Tough Project. So just kind of set things up. Um, in this talk, we wanted to kind of go over why does this thing even exist? What are the problems we're trying to solve? And then an overview of sort of what does the update framework do? Um, and very briefly talk about notary. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, come to the deep dive on Friday. And I've got the information for that at the end of the presentation. So ultimately, um, you know, do you know what you downloaded last night? Right? That's the problem we're trying to solve, is that you only download things that you actually trust. So we're going to look at the state of digital signing today and some of the problems with that, some of the additional problems that we actually want to solve with a new signing solution that deals specifically with software updating. Um, and then we're going to have a look at the bleeding edge, so essentially the update framework and its implementation in the form of notary. So kicking it off, the state of digital signing. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, this is one of my favorite devices from sort of pre-digital signing. This is an auto pen. It's used to forge signatures, typically the signatures of the US president on less than official documents. Um, so it's a tool that's specifically designed for creating a fake signature that's indistinguishable from the original. Uh, but going on to what we're really here to talk about. Signing is based on asymmetric cryptography. And quick show of hands, who's already familiar with the idea of asymmetric cryptography? OK, that's, that's better than normal. Um, there's still a few hands down. So for those that aren't familiar, uh, asymmetric cryptography relies on the idea that you can generate an asymmetric pair of keys. So a pair of keys where they're different in some way, and they can essentially perform the inverse of each other's operations. So if you encrypt with one, you decrypt with the other one. If you sign with one, you verify with the other one. One of these keys you keep private, you keep it to yourself, maybe you store it on hardware, you probably want to store it somewhere secure, so maybe a laptop that you don't bring online very often. Uh, I have mine in a YubiKey, which is a little hardware device that I have to plug into my computer. Um, if you're in a large enterprise environment, you might use a hardware security module, which is like a dedicated box that you're going to plug into your uh, infrastructure. The public key you then share with everybody. It doesn't matter who knows the public key. Other people are going to use that public key to encrypt things to send to you that only you're going to be able to decrypt using the other half, which is the private key. I say one of the most common ways to make use of asymmetric cryptography is GPG, the GNU Privacy Guard. Now, this doesn't actually implement any cryptographic algorithms. It's a tool chain, serialization. It gives you all of the other stuff you need around the actual cryptographic ciphers to be able to do those signing and encryption operations. So if you're sending signed emails, you'll probably install, if you're on a Mac, it'll be GPG Suite. Um, and that has integrations into mail. And you can just check a box to say, yep, sign my emails for me. Um, you can import other people's keys into that, other people's public keys. When they send you a signed email, you'll be able to verify those people sent it to you. So this really is just there to sort of ease the whole use of uh, cryptography. But it has a lot of problems. Um, there are, so sort of moving on to things we still want to solve, um, and we'll sort of look at the problems as they come up. Uh, one of the key things we want to solve with signing is integrity. Is this package untampered? Uh, does it come from the person that I actually think it came from? Um, GPG does a reasonable job with the tampering. Like if you trust the key, you have a way to verify that you know, the package hasn't been tampered with since it was signed. But there are issues with how you actually manage those keys. And we'll talk about those. So that's authenticity. Do I know who actually owns this key? Do I know what this key was actually approved for? Now, with GPG, we use the web of trust. The web of trust relies on the fact that, say, you know, I've met somebody in this room, I have verified their identity, and I take my private key, and I actually sign their key to say, yes, I have verified that person's identity. And then somebody else who wants to consume content that that person published will look at their web of trust, and they'll say, you know, I trust anyone who has three degrees of separation from me. So if I can hop through and within three hops get to that other person, I'll trust the fact that they're actually in control of their key. That's a very tenuous connection, 
right? If your key is compromised, maybe that can be used to sign other people's keys so it looks like you trust them, but you don't. Uh, if that person's key has been compromised, there aren't really good mechanisms for them to inform you that it's been compromised, particularly if you don't know them. You know, if you're one degree of trust, they might email you, say, hey, my key has been compromised, don't trust it anymore, here is my new key. And if you miss that message, you're gonna continue to trust the old one. So again, another failure point in our system. But if you're multiple degrees of separation away, you might not get a notification at all. Like a good example of that is many of the Linux distributions have had their package signing keys compromised. And they've had to send out emails to their users saying, you know, really sorry, this server got compromised, it had keys on it, we actually don't know if the keys were compromised, but in case they were, stop trusting the old key and here's the new one to trust. And if you don't get that message, you never update your servers. Even if you do get the message, maybe you miss a server. Like it's very easy here for you to not get the update and to continue to trust keys that you shouldn't trust anymore. So authenticity is a real problem in our existing systems. Leading on from that, we have the issue of revocation. Like I said, how do you actually communicate to somebody that the key should no longer be trusted? Certificate authorities have at least a, a, a solution to this, right? We have certificate revocation lists, so you can go and query and get back a list of all the certificates that have been blacklisted. Not fantastic, because you have to make those lists pretty large to contain every key that hasn't expired that shouldn't be trusted anymore. So then they invented OCSP, uh, which if I remember is Online Certificate Status Protocol. Um, this is, rather than querying for an entire list, you query for a specific certificate and ask the certificate authority, is this certificate still trusted? Um, but again, you have to go and do that on every single request. If you can't reach the certificate authority, how do you fail on that? Uh, revocation is also a very painful process in our existing systems. Now, in addition to these signing problems, there are additional things that we want to solve, right? We're not just looking to build something that's nicer to use. We're actually looking to build something that solves problems that are unique to software distribution and to updating your software. So software gets old, right? We all know this. The longer a piece of software sits out in the wild, things go wrong with it, uh, and not necessarily because, you know, it literally bit rots. But we discover problems, more edge cases are found, and in particular, we discover vulnerabilities, right? When a new piece of software is deployed, it looks perfect. Over time, we realize there are buffer overflows, we didn't handle some particular piece of input properly, maybe you've got a SQL injection in there. Uh, and as these vulnerabilities are discovered, they get patched, and as they're patched, we want to install newer versions of software. And now, how do we actually know that we're getting a newer version of the software? A good case that was seen, I think, in, in Justin's research was uh, there was a mirror in Eastern Europe um, for Red Hat, right? Lots of enterprises are trusting Red Hat. Uh, this mirror was reporting to the uh, Red Hat's... Ubuntu's, but it's okay. Oh, sorry. It's okay. This, this mirror was reporting to Ubuntu's um, sort of checker that I'm up to date, everything's fine, I've got all the latest packages, but when you actually went and requested Apache from it, it gave you a two-year-old version of Apache that still had a number of known vulnerabilities in it, even though the official repositories contained the new version. So being able to go and get a newer version of your software reliably is very important, and it's not a solved problem today. Like, you want to know that when you go and get your update, you're actually getting the latest version of the software with all the security fixes, with all the patches, so we need to be able to guarantee that. Now, there's, there's additionally some interesting distribution properties. Just how do I get my software from A to B? Uh, the first thing to be aware of, a lot of people assume that, you know, if I've got a TLS connection, great, I'm secure. Not the case at all. TLS is only connecting your computer that you're downloading from to the server that's serving that content. Uh, I think it'll slide order out of date. Okay, so I'm gonna have to jump back a slide in a second. Um, it's really interesting to highlight that that protection is not enough because there have been a large number of compromises essentially against the points of distribution and against the supply chain that builds your software. So this is a relatively small list. If you go and read the papers associated with the update framework, there's a much larger list than this. Um, but these are all compromises that happened over the last nine years against distribution centers. Um, and in particular, like transmission in 2016, twice it was compromised. Both of those times it was actually signed. And when you installed it on your Mac, OS X was like, great, this is signed. I'm going to install it with no warnings. And both times it was installing a remote access tool. 
Um, one of my favorite ones that I think I actually omitted from this slide uh, was in the mid-2000s, where the CIA is actually a software vendor for other government agencies. So they send agents into you know, the FBI, uh, NSA, I guess. I'm not sure which agencies trust them. But anyway, they send agents into other government agencies to update the software, right? Go in and install updates. And in this particular uh, operation, they sent in an agent who installed backdoors in the other agencies so that the CIA could make sure that those other agencies were actually sharing all of their information with them. So again, like, even when you have a very trusted source for your software, you actually want to know that what you're installing ties all the way back to the original creator, not just back to your distribution channel. And so, you know, speaking of that mirror that was deploying the two-year-old version of Apache, we want a way to actually detect if a mirror is out of date, it's expired, it's serving you old content. It might be malicious, it might just be that, you know, the script that's meant to be pulling down the updates broke. But we want to be able to detect that, and we want to know. So, how do we solve many of these problems, if not all of them? Um, I'll hand over to Justin to sort of give an overview of how the update framework actually works. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you also trust the CIA a lot more than I do. Maybe it's <laughs> part of my suspicious nature, but I don't know that regardless of who I was, I'd trust them as a software vendor. Um, great. So the real goal of the update framework, the overarching goal of it, is to be compromise resilient. And what that means is, is that you should expect that an attacker is going to be able to break into servers, they're going to steal some of your keys, they're going to be somewhere in your infrastructure, and you still want your system to be as secure as you could plausibly make it in that scenario. So it's not something of, let's have some you know, plan B or more likely plan Z or something about how we recover from a compromise. Let's, let's make that a core part of our system design so that uh, when a compromise occurs, we know exactly how to handle it and we can degrade insecurity very gracefully. So um, one of the things that uh, Tuft does in order to do this is it has a bunch of different roles that different keys or different groups of keys play within Tuft. And the reasons for this will become clear in a minute, but uh, just as an initial overview, if you'll bear with me for a slide or two, I'll explain what these roles roughly do. So we have a root of trust. The root role is the role that says these are the keys for the other roles. It's the, it also has the ability, because it's determining which keys are used for which other roles, it also is the thing that's used to revoke trust in other keys and other parts of the system. There's a targets role that's used to actually indicate what packages or containers or whatever it is we're distributing uh, are valid. So this is the thing that I think you typically think of when you think of I'm signing my software with a key. Um, that action is actually done via the targets role. The targets role says this is a valid copy of this particular piece of software. The snapshot role tells you information like um, you know the, the latest version of Apache is whatever the latest version is, right? The latest version of Firefox is this. The latest version of uh, MySQL is that, and so on. So it, it gives you information so that you can't have older versions of software be played back to you. And finally, there's the timestamp rule that basically just says, has, the, has any software on the repository been updated recently? And uh, once again, we'll see a little bit why uh, these are separated out in a minute. So, um, but first, you know, how is this information disseminated? Well, this is disseminated via a root.json file that contains the information for all these keys, which is itself signed using the root keys. So uh, the root keys sign information that, that uh, describes this because they are the fundamental root of trust on the system. So when we want to do something like rotate out a key, like let's say, for instance, that we want to change out the timestamp key, all we need to do is go and generate a new um, file here, uh, a new key for timestamp. You see that's changed. Sign it with the root key, and then that's fine. If we want to rotate out the root key itself, we generate a file that has a new root key in it and sign it with both the new and the old root keys, and now it's trusted within the system. So you can rotate out any of the keys that you like um, as, as you go through and uh, use the system. One other important feature of the way that Tuff works is, um, remember we have the root role that has uh, targets, and targets are gonna sign all the data that's, uh, all the software that's being created. 
So if you had to have everyone share and use that same key, that would be very problematic. So instead, we can have different either people or organizations that go and sign for parts of their software using different keys. So David and I may each you know, have some software that we sign as part of this repository as made, for instance, the Spiffy project. And the night, one of the things that, that Tuff lets you do is something called selective delegations, where we can actually also say that David, if there's a notary package, David is the one who has to sign for it. Um, and if there's a tough package, then I'm the one who has to sign for it. And if there's a spiffy or a spire package or something like that, then the spiffy group signs for it. And you can also subdelegate off of here so that, for instance, you could have Evan and Andrew and uh, Emiliano and, and all the spiffy people have their own keys be delegated off of this the spiffy role. Um, so it, it sort of streamlines the, uh, you know, the trust model and, and they can all be subdelegated with different privileges and so on. So one of the reasons why we have this, which if you really want to know in, in deep detail about why Tuff does all this and how this works, we do have the deep dive session. But to just give you a little taste of it, um, these keys that you have in a system get used with different amounts of frequency. So you're using something like your timestamp key, which is saying when is the last time there's been an update. It has to be used for every update. This is something that's, that's going to be refreshed very, um, it's going to be used very frequently. Uh, in, in some cases, it's effectively almost to the point where every client that comes gets, gets something fresh signed by the timestamp server in some deployments. The snapshot role is used whenever a version of something gets changed. And target keys are used whenever a person who's signing for that specific type of target goes to sign something. So think of it if you're a developer and you're making a new release of your software, you need to pull a YubiKey out of a drawer or do something like that in order to do it. And the root keys are really only used when um, there's a compromise of one of the other top level keys, which in production almost never happens. Um, and, or the more likely case is that you set the expiration of that metadata to be something like every six months or every year or something so that people then have to come together and dig out their keys and you make sure everybody still has them so that you, you find out that they haven't lost them like six years after the after you set things up and you finally need to do a revocation. Um, and in, in most production environments, the targets and root role are kept entirely offline. So there are things, uh, what I mean by that is, is that they're not like physically plugged in, not even an HSM or something like that in a server. They're physically disconnected from, from the internet. So there are things like YubiKeys that developers will go and plug into their laptop when they need to use them. Um, and the root keys may, in some deployments at least, are even kept in like safety deposit boxes. Uh, one other thing that I'll say about this, which I've kind of hinted at a couple times, so I'll make explicit, is, is that for any of these um, for keys and roles, but especially the root role, although sometimes target roles, you can also have thresholds of keys where, for instance, if you're an organization where, um, let's say you might be collecting you know, data that, that could be considered sensitive, like let's say you're providing an email service and you're concerned that perhaps, I don't know, the U.S. government may come to you and tell you that they have to have your signing keys or they'll shut you down. I mean, not that that would ever happen, you know, but um, suppose that were the case. Uh, one thing you could possibly do is keep uh, different parts of your root keys in the system or even different parts of your target keys in different countries or in different jurisdictions or in different areas to make it harder for a single person or a government or another entity to compel you to, to do something like that. Um, one other quick point I'll, I'll bring up here is, is that the way that you get the initial trust in the system is typically when you go and download software, you'll download a copy of the root metadata or at least the keys uh, used for the root metadata and that helps you bootstrap trust inside of the system. Um, so the typical way that this works is that you end up with this like root.json that you get in, in the first place. You verify that the timestamp is signed, you verify the snapshot and the targets and then you move on from there. Um, and so Tuff has a number of improvements over uh, traditional ways, like you know some of the simpler ways of just using TLS or uh, GPG or doing other things like that to do your signatures. Um, one of which is, is that this way that we do things with delegations and trust is very much a whitelisting approach. So um, you, in a file, have to indicate which keys you trust for which things, and then someone has to say, 
that they've signed this particular package with that key. This isn't um, this isn't something where uh, you know I've, there are other approaches, including some of the revocation list approaches and things that are very blacklist based or are very susceptible to you being fed and given outdated information. So the way we use whitelisting protects against uh, a lot of those types of concerns. Um, one thing that I think is quite surprising to a lot of people that first take a look at the sorts of things that they've seen here with Tuff is they look at it and they say, my gosh, there's a lot of keys here. This has got to be a big problem to have, like to use in production. And one of the things that um, we've had people time and time again tell us is so surprising is, is that I didn't realize how easy it would be to actually do this. Because basically, it's like you generate some keys on startup when you set up your system. And then you, you know, if you are like a developer has to sign something, you just sign it with your key, just like you would do to sign to GPG sign something or whatever. And, and that's it. Like, you know, you don't have to think or worry or do anything about here. It's just something that gets plugged into your architecture. It's like a one-time cost. And then after that, it's, it's seamless for you, and it's, it's absolutely transparent. Your end users don't even know about it. Um, even to the point that the way that we found out that several of our adopters were using Tough is because they let a key expire or forgot to do something, and then an end user complained about it. And in the error log, it said, like, Tough, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, like this big provider has tough outage. And we're like, oh, wow, they're using tough. And no one even knew. Uh, so, um, yeah, you do have to keep on top of things. I mean, that's the thing is, is that you, you can't, you know, it's, the system is designed to try to be smart about making sure that you do things correctly. Um, we have multi-signature trust that's well supported throughout the system. So um, you're not relying on a single key to be kept secure. You don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. You can uh, divide things up and, and use appropriate um, mechanisms for this. You never need to share keys in Tough. If, if you ever think that two people should have the same key because, oh, you know, well, we're going to sign the same packages or something, you can just delegate to both of them. It's super easy to do. One, even one of you can just delegate to the other. Um, it's, it's very simple to do, very straightforward, and um, you always want to do that. Revocation is absolutely a first class thing in Tough. It was a primary design choice in a lot of the fundamental ways that we do this. And for anybody who's had to do revocation in like GPG, PGP based system or in the web, um, you know that this was not a first class design decision. This was not something that was like the first thing they were thinking about when they designed these systems. It was something that was, you know, item like 37B at, at the end. Um, when things started to go wrong. So revocation is absolutely central to what we do and is actually very smooth and easy to do. Um, and once again, we make sure that you don't have expired metadata, the things that you get are, are timely and correct to, pre to prevent against situations, for instance, like people replaying old metadata or freezing you on a certain old piece of metadata. Um, and one uh, last kind of interesting point about Tough is Tough is not just something that's only used in Docker and only used in CNCF and in the cloud. Um, it's used in a lot of other domains. It's used in programming languages. There are even cars. Uh, one, I, I'm, since this is recorded, I'm not allowed to talk in a lot of detail about this, but one of the big three US automakers is mandating that a variant of Tough is used in, in their cars that are coming out now. We're also in automotive grade Linux, which is used in Honda, Toyota, and we have a lot of other uh, very positive adoptions that if the automotive industry wasn't quite so secretive, I would love to, to tell you about. So you could brag that you were riding in your hot, hot ride with, uh, with Tough under the covers or things like that. Um, so, uh, but with that, we're all here to learn about the cloud. And what I want to know is, what is the best way to use Tuff in the cloud? All right. So, um, you know, Docker is, uh, we like to say, we democratize containers. Um, as part of that, we want a way to distribute the images that we use to instantiate containers securely. So when it came time to look at how we're going to do, you know, signing and trusted distribution for uh, containers, um, we chose the update framework, but at the time, there wasn't a uh, sort of production grade version of Tough. You know, there was, there was a proof of concept implementation. It was a suite of Python tools. You fire up the Python in, in, uh, interpreter. You import, I want to say, about 20 different packages. Um, and then you run a lot of manual commands, like open file, read file, sign file, modify. Um, it was kind of painful. Um, in addition, there wasn't any way to deal with all of the online hosting of that content and you know, pushing updates, getting updates from the server. So what we built at Docker was Notary. 
um, which as you all know, because we're here at cube slash cloud native con, uh, is a member of the CNCF, along with the update framework itself. Um, and Notary is um, fully open source. It has been from the start. Uh, and it's a, it's a vanilla implementation of the update framework. Like even though we built it in Docker, even though we've integrated it into Docker as this thing called Docker Content Trust, Notary itself has no knowledge about Docker. It has no knowledge about images or containers. It just cares about you've got a chunk of digital content. You want to sign it. You want to push it up to some metadata server. And you want to tell people they can go and download it from there. So the architecture is a client. Um, that's the Notary CLI. Uh, we also have a library that you can use in Go, at least, to implement uh, Notary into your own applications. Um, and we've defined an actual Go interface for the library, so it should be reasonably clear by now um, what's there for use versus what's kind of internal. For a long time, we didn't have that interface, and nobody could work out how to use it properly as a library. So I hope that helps. Um, the client talks to a server. It's a straight HTTP server, has a URL structure that is... Um, and this is maybe the one place where Docker does kind of show up. The URL structure was designed to be compatible with the Docker registry. Um, but if you didn't know about the Docker registry, it's still a sensible URL structure. It's essentially like repository name, slash, and then like the normal tough sort of path structure. So um, yeah, it's not overly important. Anyway, the server um, deals with metadata, signed metadata. It never sees any private keys. Uh, it receives updates. It verifies that update is correct, particularly if you've already got some previous ex previously existing version of the repository. You want to make sure that anybody that already has seen that old version, when they go and download your next update, it's actually going to successfully, um, successfully download and validate. So the server does all those checks for you to make sure that uh, a user is actually going to be able to download your update. Uh, and then it goes and talks to this backend service we created, which call it the signer. The signer holds your timestamping key. Uh, the reason for that is just timestamping, like we said, is meant to happen very frequently. It certainly needs to happen on every single update. And particularly if you have a repository with lots of collaborators, you don't want to have to delegate like a timestamp key for every single one of them. Um, additionally, I think if you come on Friday, we'll talk a little bit about what happens when certain keys get compromised. There's very little you can actually do when a timestamp key is compromised. Um, oh, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. I, I mostly wanted to set the water bottle down, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to add to it. Yeah, all, all you can do is just say, for a short period of time, there hasn't been an update when, in fact, there has. So for maybe a day or something, you can say, oh, no, we haven't released a new version of software. Yeah. Um, the signer itself has a secret that you inject at runtime. That secret is used to encrypt all of the private keys before it stores them in a database for persistence. Importantly, we implemented mechanisms to be able to rotate that secret so that you know, if you think for some reason the secret's been exposed, you can change it and you can force the signer to go and re-encrypt all of those keys. Um, that's kind of all of the components of Notary. Like it's, it's not horribly complicated, I think. Um, there are some things that we would like to do with it, uh, sort of additional features we want to build in. Uh, the signer particularly, um, but also the client would benefit from integrations with hardware security modules. Uh, we have a YubiKey integration in the client which uses PKCS 11 um, and only works for root keys. Some weird reasons behind why that's the case and we never got around to like expanding it to be used for sort of developer keys essentially. Um, but the hardware integrations uh, would really sort of make this an enterprise product um, for a lot of use cases. Uh, a lot of organizations require that any online private keys sit in an HSM. Uh, we'd also like um, local file-based repo management. <laughs> Essentially, the client requires that there's a server. Uh, and there are some people who are like, ah, I just want to do things locally and I'll worry about the server myself. Um, all the capabilities to do that are inside Notary. We just haven't kind of pieced together the things to give you a set of commands that actually enable you to do that. Um, and then we haven't fully implemented the thresholding, like the multi-signatures in Tough. We can consume them quite happily, and we've got the tests to make sure that all of that works. What we had issues with is the whole user experience on the signing side 
So it's like if Justin and I both need to sign something, and maybe there's a third member of our team that we also work with, and this requires two out of three signatures. Like if I produce a new piece of content and I sign it and I send it to Justin and say, hey, Justin, can you please sign this for me? The third person in the team might be doing the same thing at the same time, and that creates contention. Uh, and we don't really have a good way of dealing with like the human user experience of dealing with that contention. So if anybody has any ideas about that, if anybody's worked on similar problems, um, we'll also talk about more like why this is the case and why the contention exists in the deep dive on Friday, because it, it dives into like the actual data structures and how Tough solves problems on sort of the very, um, I guess, implementation specific level. Uh, but yeah, we'd be very interested in having discussions on that. Um, if you're interested in learning more, like I said, we have the Tough uh, and Notary deep dive on Friday at 11.55 in B4M1, which is somewhere on this side of the building. Uh, I highly recommend you read the Tough specification if you're interested. It's not that long. Even if you're just flying somewhere close in Europe, I'm pretty sure you can read it on your plane flight. Um, and it's actually, it's very, very clear. Uh, I would say it's one of the easiest specifications I've actually read. Um, and then obviously there's the Notary repository, and we have some more documentation in there on specifically how Notary works uh, under the Docs folder if you're interested. Um, I am also proud to say that when I had a new developer start on the team at Docker, I got them to install Notary as their first project to show how awesome both Go and uh, Docker are. Because you can literally just go get the repo, CD into it, Docker compose up, and the Go get will have installed Notary, the Docker compose up brings everything up, and you have a completely working local environment. So if you want to play with it, Notary is really simple to get up and running. Um, that's all we had. Uh, I think we have a little time yeah, about five minutes or so for Q&A. Yeah, uh, repeat, so repeat the question. yeah, the question is, what's the difference between a target and, and snapshot? So target is a way of saying that this specific instance of uh, this software is a valid piece of software. So if you think about um, like GPG signing a package, that equivalent action is putting a line in your targets file that says, I say this secure hash of this uh, file is valid, and then you sign that whole file. The snapshot role is effectively a global way that an entire repository says, the latest version of package A is 1.0. The latest version of package B is 3.2, and so on. So this is a file that's, that's not generated by the individual developers, but is collectively trying to prevent you from having uh, like a, a repository that's taken over um, tell you, oh yeah, you know, oh, you're looking for uh, SendMail? Well, the latest version is 0 0.1. Uh, please install it. I, I'm sure that will go well for you from a security standpoint. Because um, this has been, these sorts of issues are things we've seen in, in practice. Isn't that the timestamp? The timestamp says the last time that the repository itself has seen an update. So um, the there's the, the timestamp is, is effectively, you can think of it as a hash over the entire repository's contents. Okay, it signs basically a hash over the, you know, over everything. And the reason why timestamp, like there's a couple reasons why they're separate, but one of the reasons why they're separate is, is that in some deployments, people who do things like have mirrors will give the mirrors uh, the timestamp role, but not the snapshot role. Because there's only sort of, you know, the, the, um, like the global signing operation, you know, and, and collection of data that's coming comes through a single source that then snapshot signs. Yet the like individual parties that are handing things out will say, oh, I haven't retrieved an update in some amount of time. Um, well, yeah, we actually, so we actually just sat in a talk from IBM, who've just open sourced something called Portieris, which is essentially the version of they actually they took Notary. It's the version of a client that does signature validation when you deploy onto a Kubernetes cluster. Um, as far as I understand it, it only works in like Bluemix Cloud or something. Um, 
There's also uh, Collide, which do like a commercialized OS query type, you know, host monitoring, scanning type thing. They implemented Notary for uh, the software updater of like OS query on your hosts. And then there's obviously all of the automotive yeah. stuff. So, so there's, we're aware of implementations in like C, Rust, um, OCaml, uh, Haskell. OCaml, Haskell. There's, there's a bunch of them. And even our reference implementation, um, David is completely right that it wasn't production ready. Um, it has gotten a lot better to the point that um, we're going to have a very serious deployment that's that's using it uh, very soon. Um, uh, yeah, so there's there's a, there's a lot of choice out there, and if you are looking for an implementation that has certain properties or does certain things that the um, that Notary or the reference implementation don't, then just reach out to us, and we may be able to connect you with the right people. I'm going to keep going until I'm told to stop. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah, and if, if anybody wants to...